our humanity is the issue. And we're supposed to pretend that when it comes to us, somehow these things are different and nobody can understand what it is to be us but us. It's so limiting. And yet, Glenn, the sad thing is that there's so many people, that's how they feel special. They feel like that's what makes them special people, but there's so much more that makes them special people than that. I wish they'd stop that. I wish that they would pride themselves on something more idiosyncratic and specific than this exaggerated sense of eternal victimhood. Frustrating. That's what this is. Tell our own story. Hello, John McWhorter. How are you? Hi, Glenn. How are you? Doing well. Glenn Lowry, The Glenn Show. Uh, I teach at Brown University. I'm John Paulson, Senior Fellow at the Manhattan Institute. The Manhattan Institute sponsors The Glenn Show, and I'm with John McWhorter, who teaches at Columbia University, writes for The New York Times, uh, host Lexicon Valley, his own podcast and talks with me every other week here in conversation about this and that uh, in our long-running uh, conversation here at The Glenn Show. So welcome back, uh, John. Good Thank to you. Be talking with you. As always, yes. So what's on your mind these days, John? Well, Glenn, uh, I, um, I'm running up against, not me personally, but I'm noticing that there's a meme. We have to tell our own stories. And why I'm thinking about it is because in my hometown of Philadelphia, there was commissioned a big, beautiful statue of Harriet Tubman, and it happened to have been created by a white man, a white man of about 50, actually of rural, impecunious Southern heritage. And so he's he's known, not being noticed, he's known a degree of deprivation, but He did um, the sculpture. He had done it before, and it had made a lot of happy noise. And so his sculpture, or a copy of it, was chosen. There was an outcry that that's not right, that if there's going to be a statue of Harriet Tubman in a public place forever, then it should be created by a black person, because we should tell our own stories, as it's put. We're supposed to tell our story. And so a, a white person's sculpture is not appropriate. And, you know, we, we both know that Ten years ago, people would have been less likely to make that case so uncompromisingly as they are now. It's the new fashion. And that way of putting it, we need to tell our own story. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you jump in, but I don't like it because, as with so many of these things, it's a euphemism. It's people not saying what they mean. It's not about us telling our own story. What that means is we have to do this. Only we should do this because only we understand the racism that we suffer. We suffer a racism that most white people are in some kind of denial about. They can never fully understand it. And so we have to tell our story means we have to depict our suffering because no one else can possibly understand it. And I don't like that as a watch cry for our race. It's fake, and it also feels very weak and reductive. Suffering is not the essence of Black identity to an extent that would make that idea that White people can't make statues of us because they don't understand what happened to George Floyd and that we suffer microaggressions. No, I don't like it. What about you? I'm befuddled, uh, but not surprised that there would be uh, uproar and protest against a white sculptor crafting uh, a monument to Harriet Tubman that would sit in public in Philadelphia. Because I'm just wondering if anybody could tell by looking at any kind of monument what color the person was who crafted it. Mm-hmm. You know, so there, there, is there really that much of a identity driven uh, impact on the act of sculpting or for that matter of crafting a piece of music uh, or writing a novel that mm-hmm that I would be able to tell. I mean, it's like a Turing test. You know the Turing test about how you know if you're dealing with an artificial intelligence? Yeah. It's like I would want to give the person the test, you know, to see whether or not they could ever figure out what the race was of the person. And if they, if they can't do that, then it's not permitted to constrain the race of the person going forward since uh, it, it doesn't have any real... It's, it, it feels like it's symbolic. Uh, aside from the full employment program for African-American artists, which is if you're going to do something, I want the work to go to a black person. 
you know. There's, there's some ar- argument there, you know. That is more understandable to me. I mean, I, I think I might yet object to that, but that would be, uh, there's uh, money been appropriated. There's an opportunity for someone to express themselves. There are many people who would like to avail themselves of that opportunity. And since it's about the Black story, I want that to be given to a Black person. That I, I can understand that a little bit more. But um, other than that. Yeah, and you know, it's, um, that's an important thing. We have to tell our own story. And the implication of that is that white people couldn't, and that you could tell. There's some way you could see. But actually, that makes no sense. And we're basically throwing down a gauntlet and daring people to say it doesn't make any sense. It reminds me, actually, of something I have to dump on Samuel L. Jackson a little bit. He said about the movie Get Out that the young black actor, whose name I forget right now, who played Mm -hmm. the the black male part, that Mm -hmm. when it came to the scene in the movie where the police seemed to be coming after him, that because that guy is African, he could not portray what a a black American man feels in that situation. And the problem is, what did the actor do wrong? Nothing at all. No one would ever have said that. He portrayed it perfectly well. But Samuel Jackson, I don't think he's known as somebody who's impossible and ridiculous about race. I think, uh, unfortunately, he's just normal. He has to say that. He has to imply that only we, Black Americans, could tell our own stories. And by the way, longtime um, Glenn and John watchers on Get Out, remember how I said that I refused to see it because too many white people had told me I needed to see it and and watch some interesting lessons? I still haven't seen it. I have insisted (laughs) on seeing it. But I know there's that stand. (laughs) When he takes a stand, I'm doing it because it's just stupid. But no, I still haven't seen it. Well, it's akin to cultural appropriation, is it not? Uh, This kind of thing, you know. uh, Does Harriet Tubman only belong to Black history? Is that a silly question? Is it our is it is it our history? God, isn't it supposed to be partly white history? Like, isn't Isn't the idea supposed to be that a white man from the South of all places makes the statue of Harriet Tubman? I thought that's what we were looking for. Yeah. And instead, he's an interloper. It's not right. Well, they're not going to take a statue down no matter who (laughs) who builds it. You know, the funny thing about it is that if you look at the statue he did, he's got the right expression on her face. Like he, the statue he, is the statue is extant. It's a it's, it's available extant, for public. In, in many co- in many copies. Yeah, it's in it, it's been praised because it's a good statue, but apparently not good enough to stand in Philadelphia. You have to have a contest, and then in the contest you have to only choose black people and pretend that it was an accident, which is what I believe they're doing, and it just doesn't work. And the idea that you know he can't tell her story, maybe if he were doing her with her hand sitting on her lap, looking placidly out at us. Maybe that wouldn't quite tell the story, but he, he gets it. There's a body language. There's a certain set of the jaw. He is telling the story. If anybody said that the person who did that sculpture was named, I'm going to make something up, um, Marcus Lee Harrison, nobody would say, really? Did a black American man do that? It looks just, just like anything. It, all, our humanity is the issue. And we're supposed to pretend that when it comes to us, somehow these things are different and nobody can understand what it is to be us but us. That's so limiting. And yet, Glenn, the sad thing is that there's so many people, that's how they feel special. They feel like that's what makes them special people. But there's so much more that makes them special people than that. I wish they'd stop that. I wish that they would pride themselves on something more idiosyncratic and specific than this exaggerated sense of eternal victimhood. It's frustrating, and that's what this is. Tell our own story, please. All right. Well, well folks, I, I'm looking out in the distance because I'm in my bungalow, and there's like scenery over there. I'm not ignoring the the setting here. So, I envy you, John. You have gotten away here. We're speaking just before Labor Day, and classes are going to start at Brown University on the Thursday after Labor Day. I don't know, or I think it's the Wednesday after Labor Day. I teach on Tuesday, Thursday. Columbia is Tuesday. Yeah. We're starting again. What are you teaching in the fall semester? This semester is a very ordinary one. I'm teaching my flagship course, Introduction to Linguistics. Big course introduces people to the subject. 
Then I'm doing a seminar on language contact, what happens when languages come into contact with each other. That's once a week with the smartest kids in the world. So, you know, it's one, it's easy, and two, it's fun. So those are the two things that I'm doing. You do two courses in each semester? Mm-hmm. Don't you do, didn't you do two and two? I did two and one. Our, our yeah. load was three courses a year uh, in the economics department, unlike some other departments at Brown, actually, uh, based mm-hmm. on the structure of the economics academic market, where most top schools only require three courses a year from their faculty in economics. Huh. And it's hard to recruit uh, people if there's more teaching here than there is there. Really? So, you know, I think the load is two and two in just about every uh, department. Yeah, I thought that was uh, normal. Hmm. The economics department is an exception. But I am in the phased retirement uh, situation of teaching half time. So I'm teaching a half course in the fall, which is to say it's a full lecture course, but I have a co-lecturer and I'm only responsible for half of the classes. Hmm. Uh, for the lecture. I'm going to attend all the classes, but I'm only going to be on call to give the lecture in half of the classes. I've never had that experience where you get to just sit there every other time. I guess I can pipe up, you know, during the the discussion and offer my question or thought or amplification, but it's a, she is a younger colleague, an economist named uh, Emily Scarbeck is her name, and she's very uh, good uh, adjunct. Uh, not tenure track, but mm. valued uh, lecturer in our department. Um, and uh, we come at the material. The material is race and inequality in the context of crime, punishment, and policing. Mm-hmm. So we come, you know, with our respective experiences. She's white. She's female. She's young, younger than me. Consider, I mean, decades younger. Mm-hmm. So, so we'll bring, you know, bring different kind of perspectives to the class. It'll be an interesting uh, challenge, mm-hmm. uh, actually, to uh, figure out exactly how to coordinate and, you know, mm-hmm. sh- share the responsibility of responding to our students. Uh, yeah, it, that that sounds interesting. One of the um, one of the things that people don't think about when it comes to college professoring. And I'm sure this is true with other teaching too, but it's part of what we do. And I don't think the students need to know, you know, they're, they're paying for the service, et cetera, but it takes work to bring it every time. And I know I'm one to say this when I'm <laughs> in Ivy school, I'm doing two and two and there are people out there busting their butts doing five and four and working as adjuncts. I'm fully aware of that. But within the two and two, especially if that's all you know, if it's only you, and especially if it's a big class where you have to get up there and basically it's a performance. And I enjoy yeah, it. It's a performance. But if you're talking to 200 people, you have to get up there and do a show and you have to get up there and you have to bring it no matter how you feel. You know, I found it particularly hard when my kids were really young. That, that we're, I'm kind of past that now. But even otherwise, just you have other stuff to do and you have to give it the full energy. And my sense is always they should not be able to tell that I'm not in the mood or that I didn't get any sleep last night or that I have somewhere to be after. I should give them the same thing each time. And I try to. That takes work. Yeah, that's that. That really is part of the effort of our job is doing that. You're not just standing up there running your mouth, or if you are, you're not doing it right. And so, yeah, um, that's why I'm sitting here thinking. Imagine being able to just walk into the room and sit down. That's that. That would be interesting. Half the time, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you get butterflies? You mean you before? The, yeah, stage fright kind of thing before performing. Oh, no, 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 not, not since the very first time I stood up in front of a class. I, I drank two shots of gin, literally, and then <laughs> just got up there, and they seemed to like what I was doing. No, I, have, I am rock-ribbed <laughs> in that way. No. I still feel nervous sometimes before going into class. Really? I'm going to do it. Yeah, I know. I know. Tell me why. Tell so me, that's interesting. Why? You uh, of all people. Will I have enough to say? Uh, mm-hmm. you know, do, do I, because you know me, I mean, when I give a little talk, often I have a script, you know, that I follow, I've ta- mm-hmm. I've written the talk out in advance. I might ad lib a little bit, but I have my, have my security. Uh, when I have to stand up and lecture, I, you know, I, I'm not going to write out a lecture and then read it to the students. I, I, I have to be spontaneous. I have to be improvisational. 
Yeah. I'd have to, uh, there should be a structure. I'll write out an outline in advance. I know the points that I want to make, but it should be, it should be alive, not, not the recitation of something. Mm-hmm. And I have to be prepared to respond, you know, because people can raise their hand and ask a question or make an observation. Especially with highly prepared students. Yeah, they ask questions. So I, it's probably more me than anything. I mean, just a psychological defect about security, insecurity or whatever. I, you know, I, I, I feel I'm going to be flat footed. So I'm, you know, cramming and I'm, you know, up at the last minute looking over my notes and whatever. And I, <laughs> But once I once I get in there. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, I've never run out of stuff to say during the middle of a class. <laughs> now you're making me think, all right, I used to worry about that. I think a lot of young professors in particular running out of material because yeah. in the beginning, you don't have that sense of timing. And yeah, you know, but often during the first years, I would do something and then realize that we're two thirds through and I don't really have anything else to say and I've got to fake it. And you take advantage of the kids that ask more questions or you make something up on the fly. I used to hate that. So during the two thirds, I was fine, but I did used to walk in thinking, is there enough? But I've been doing it so long now that everything is timed out fine. And I'm also, I can improvise. You you have a sense of it. So I don't have that anymore, but I remember that very well because if you run out, it's like you you have your pants down. There's actually, and I'm not going to say who it is because there's no point, but I know on good authority that there is a very, very prominent public intellectual who is great with the gift of gab and the anecdotes and the star power. But when that person walks into a classroom, he's supposed to go for an hour and 15 and tends to kind of conk out after about 40 minutes because he just kind of walks in and does some routines. He doesn't actually prepare a lecture. Knowing him, he doesn't mind. He's just such a star that him walking in and inhaling is considered wonderful. I would never do that because I would just feel like it looked like I didn't know things. Yeah. So you have to watch out for that. I'll tell you who it was when we're not being recorded. <laughs> yeah, we don't want to we don't want to traffic in that kind of gossip on people. No. No. Uh Okay, well I'm I'm resigned to the fact that I have to work for a living. Uh, but you're always working for a living. You're going to continue to be writing uh, your column every uh, every week, every other week or so. Uh, for a long time, I, I like this. This business of writing a column and every literate person in the world reads it. I'll take this. It's, it's good. It's, it's a lot of work. I hate to admit that what I'm thinking of as time goes by is, hmm, how do I do a little bit less of the, the, the teaching stuff? Not the academic. I want to keep at least pretending to have ideas on how language works. But the Columbia part in particular, I don't know if I can keep this up forever. But I'm going to keep up with the writing as long as they have me. It's a, it's a high. It really is. It's a challenge to come up with something that people genuinely are going to want to read every week. That's the thing. You can't phone it in with the times. I have to think this has to be as good as last week. But then again, life is a challenge. So, yeah, I'm going to keep doing that. How far in advance are you written? You know? Um, none. And, like, they suggest that you have columns kind of stacked up. But yeah. I, don't, I don't have time to do that. I'm doing this with you, and I've got classes and kids and books I want to read. So, no, I make it up. Generally, I don't even want to say how closely before my deadline it usually is. But no, I don't, I don't have a surplus. No. Yes, OMG. How much help do you get? Uh, maybe I'm uh, asking stuff that it's how the sausage is made kind of stuff. <laughs> but I mean, is there a staff? Is, does, are people, re- do you have a researcher? Do you, you have, uh, you know, like ghost writers, somebody? Not, I mean, not writing for you, but, you know, somebody who gives you three paragraphs and says, you know, this could be a piece or oh, how does it work? Wow. Just you mentioning that, and I kind of cringed a little bit. It would feel like somebody invading my space, which is my writing space. I'm weird. I'm supposed to have an assistant. Everybody assumes that I do, that I've got some person who kind of does half the work, and then I fill it out and do the phraseology. That would be the same thing to do. I would get more sleep. I would, you know, I would not be getting my exercise and sitting there thinking, what am I going to be writing about? But no, I don't have that person because for me, it is a, it's a personal thing, what I'm going to write about. 
if I had a research assistant, I'd spend as much time telling them what to look up as I spend looking it up myself, especially now that, let's face it, the research is all online. You just go like this. I don't need to tell someone else. Maybe if it were still about sending somebody to the library, I would have to have an assistant. But with the way it is now, having the assistant would take up time that I would rather spend thinking up and writing the piece. So it really is, it's a one-man show. It is all me. I think the times people wish that I would announce beforehand a few days what I was going to write about and also chat with them about it. I'm not good at that. I'm taking a shower and I think of it and I start outlining it while I'm putting on my clothes and then I sit down and I do it. That's my modus operandi. Whereas I know for a lot of people, it would be to be on the phone with that assistant. But no, however, I should say, there is um, incredible fact-checking at the Times. They are dogged. I learn from them. There are things that I have in my head. Oh, that musical was 1951. Somebody will come up with it. It's 1952. I'll quote something out of my head. Somebody will dig up who, what the person actually said. They are really good at that. To the point that, to an extent, I let them do a little bit of the research. Like, there are times when I think, I don't know where I read that, but Emily okay, will find somebody it. can find it. Yeah, so a little of, of that. That's where I do get a little bit of help. And they do what I would want a research assistant to do. So I'll just say, you know, Emily, I shouldn't call. I don't know. I have, Emily, you know what? Um, you know, could you please look up where? Blah, 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 because I can't find it. And they have more of the magazine subscriptions. There are things that are behind a wall for me that they can just look up. But only, only a little of that. So... I was looking at your uh, columns of the two languages walking to a bar. I thought that was a pretty clever title. <laughs> this, is, this is about English versus Spanish in uh, Miami and how the languages interact with each other in terms of the uh, usage. Mm -hmm. uh, that, was, that was pretty I didn't pretty make up the title for the record. I'm pretty sure that was my editor, Christopher. But um, yeah, I liked writing that piece. That one came out easy. That was I was trying to be late summer, and that was... That was what that was. So, yeah. And people kept asking me about Miami English, this, these expressions that people use in Miami that come from the way you would put something in Spanish, except it's in English. And people kept asking me about it. And I thought, well, all right, let's say something. And then the thing is, you can't phone it into the Times. I can't just write about it. That's not interesting. You have to have a hook. Like, what, what else? And so then I thought, well, actually, listening to the Yiddishified English at this bungalow colony, that's the parallel. So then uh -huh. that's, that's the piece. Instead of saying, this is what's happening in Miami, they can read the article themselves. So it's that sort of thing. You have to have that creative spark every week. I don't know whether our listeners care that much about this, but yeah, that is what, that's what it's like. So I saw an earlier column of yours, maybe it's a couple of weeks ago, about um, hip hop. Uh, mm -hmm. And poetry. Yeah. Uh, why don't you tell the audience uh, what, what your argument is? Because I have a bone to pick. All right. You know how if you, um, a lot of you probably have a grandfather or maybe a great grandfather who can, you know, that gets straight, starts reciting some long poem. It's going to be Evictus or something by Longfellow or Robert Frost. And, and he knows all of it. I'm sorry for that Grandpa Simpson voice, but people of that generation, they know their poetry. And that went out in the late 20th century, that idea that you have a few poems that you can recite from your head. Like, I know not a single poem, and I probably never will, and I'm a very well-educated person. I think I'm typical in that way. That ended in the 60s and 70s. But I was just trying to make the point that it's no longer true that Americans don't have poetry. Because you can watch people who speak other languages and they can just snap off some poetry. And I used to always think Americans don't have poetry. But actually, we do. Because if you talk to anybody, it really, at this point, it's under 60. It's basically my age and younger. I'm 57, by the way. But under 60, you have people who can just recite reams and reams of rap lyrics. And not only the ones about butts and bitches and shooting people, but the ones that are about more constructive topics. And this is just perfectly ordinary. I've noticed this for 20 years, and it's no longer only black people. It hasn't been like that since roughly 1996. Everybody knows some rap. And that's poetry. It rhymes. It is highly verbally focused. 
there is music behind it, but it's it's a rhythm and all of it is written out on paper and can be anthologized in as a book, as Jay-Z's work has been. And I think to myself that you see somebody walking around, you know, moving in that certain way and reciting, you know, they're sitting there doing about 32 lines of something. And you think, oh, there's a teenager rapping. But no, that teenager is doing the same thing as the Bryn Mawr girl who could recite Edna St. Vincent Millay a hundred years ago. It's just a different feel of poetry, but it's poetry. So I was just saying America is hooked on poetry. It's just that it comes from a very different place than it used to. I thought when I read that, well, I came along before hip hop. I mean, my teenage years were the 1960s. Um, and I can recite the lyrics of some Motown tunes like Smokey Robinson's <laughs> Tracks of My Tears. People say I'm the life of the party because I tell a joke or two. Although I may be laughing loud and hearty, deep inside I'm blue. Take a good look at my face. Uh, oh, wait a minute. I can't. I forgot. I forgot what comes next. Take a good look at my face. You'll see the smile. <laughs> look a little bit closer and you can trace the tracks of my tears. Anyway, you see what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Every generation, I'm sure it's true of my parents' generation, that they could recite the lyrics of the popular tunes of their day. Rap is popular music of uh, America. In, uh, it's a big chunk of popular music of America, and people can recite the lyrics. You don't think people can recite country lyrics? I'm sure they can. Do they rhyme? Is it poetry? Okay, let's not argue about what's poetry. But it looks a little inflated the claim that hip hop has saved poetry if you put it in that in that context which is that when you're 17 years old and you got a crush and the song that you listen to before you go to sleep every night which makes you long for your the object of your affection you're going to know that song when you're 60 years old i take your point and certainly somebody who can recite the lyrics to blue moon or can you know recite you know, whatever, whatever it is, my boyfriend's back and there's going to be trouble. <laughs> all of that. <laughs> sure. Anything. Motown, the spinners. Sure. All of that was poetry. Taylor Swift, technically, is poetry. Yes, certainly. There have always been pop songs. Or let's say that pop songs, folk songs, ditties, there's always that. But I'm talking about verse. I'm talking about something where the focus is much more on the words and richness of rhyme and rhythm than you can have when you've got a melody playing along that slows the words down and limits the resources to an extent. And that's a fine line. But if somebody can basically do all of you know, something Tupac did, that's a whole lot of words. And the beat is one thing, but you can take the beat away and the words are still the main focus. There's a richness there's just a, a volume of wordiness to it that to me is more Walt Whitman than, say, Cole Porter or, you know, whoever wrote games people play for the spinners, et cetera. All that's great stuff, but it's a uniting of music and lyric, which has a way of straightjacketing the lyric somewhat because it can only go by so fast. Because with music, usually the music is not going to be so busy as to keep up with a 35 syllable sentence. So that's that's what I what I mean. And also, well no no, in terms of how it makes people feel because people really do feel their pop lyrics deeply. But when I watch somebody basically spit out a thousand words from their memory, I think, wow. This is this is like somebody who back in the day liked their Longfellow or something like that. Although while there was Longfellow, there was Old Black Joe and Old Susanna and Hello Frisco Hello. There were songs then too. But there's a there's a there's a difference. It's a fine line, I know. And the raunchy uh, aspect of some of the of the genre that you are admiring here, the the gratuitous uh, sex, the violence, the braggadocio, the you know, I mean, the the base uh, kind of visceral kind of you know, st stuff that it, it's not very elevated. The elitist over here wants to say it's doggerel. It's not Shakespeare. It's doggerel. You know, it's what I'd hear in the pub in uh, 1590 if I was in, you know, 
Cambridge, uh, as, as they talked about, you know, the winches <laughs> instead <laughs> of the bitches. <laughs> so it's it kind of comes to the same thing. That they <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a mental exercise we have to do. A lot of it is vulgar in, the, in that way. And they're also yeah, vulgar. That was the word I was looking for. It can be said about that, but if the vulgarity, and boy, you have to be careful with this stuff today in particular, but if the vulgarity is richly depicted and cleverly rhymed, and clever rhyming is not always straight rhyming, it doesn't have to be Dr. Seuss, you can make art out of that and more to the point. The larger point is to think today that the heart of and I, I'm no expert, and I can't even fake it the way I could for about 10 minutes back there. But if you're thinking about rap, and it's 1996, the first thing you think of is all of this guns and bitches and hoes and money and all of that. That was the stuff that sold the best. That was the main stuff. That's changed. That's, that's an old conversation. That started changing when the quote-unquote conscious rappers became mainstream rappers. And so Kendrick Lamar isn't writing about shooting people in the face. That's not what he does. And so we have to be careful not to have a conversation of 1998. I would be less likely to say this. And in fact, I wrote a book that there's a hole in. It's kind of a flaw in the book, but nobody called me called me on it at the time. Doing our own thing. I wrote about how America doesn't have poetry, and I didn't say anything about rap. And part of the reason was that I wasn't paying attention, but another part of the reason was that I was thinking 50 Cent is not poetry. I would now say that that should be reconsidered. But then on the other hand, if I were writing it now, I'd know that the rap that young people I know are listening to is not about bitches and cars and, and all of that to nearly the extent that the earlier stuff was. Conscious rap is mainstream now. Remember when Common was somebody the occasional person had heard of. He was like this, the intelligent rapper. Now Common is a movie star and his music is just music, that sort of thing. So I don't know if I would have said this 20 years ago, but I think it's worth saying, saying now. Okay. Drug selling, that's, that's always in there. But again, it might be very artfully depicted. You know, so, you know, Richard Wright, James Baldwin, Claude Brown, Man Child on the Promised Land. Well, then how come you can't how come you can't put all of that to rap? Especially the last person I mentioned. And so, yeah, I really I feel I feel that. It's not my favorite kind of poetry, to tell you the truth. I find I hate to say this about a genre that has gone so many places. The basic confrontational cadence, the fact that the core of it is supposed to be usually a man. He's up there, and he's telling you the score. He knows it all. If you don't get him, you're not a good person. You spit the raps, as they call it. That basic element. And of course, not all of them do that, but mainly that's the tone. It's a little old for me after a while. You know, it, it may be poetry, but I kind of think, stop bragging. And I know that the idea is supposed to be we are black men of the street, and we have been oppressed, we're still oppressed, and now we're having our say. You're supposed to listen. I get it, but after about 15 minutes, I'm just thinking, you don't want to listen to anybody basically telling you that you can't speak and that they're the coolest person in the world. And that's what that, uh, uh, that cadence, it wears me out after a while, but I can still say that an awful lot of the work that's being done in that cadence is work. It's, it, it, it deserves respect. Poetic work, linguistically yeah. interesting work. Yeah. Yeah. You ever gone through the Jay-Z book? Like, it, yeah. it, it's all the confrontational cadence. He knows all. And that's the, that's the, the flavor. But there's a lot in there. It's an anthology of something somebody put a lot of work into. And that's true of a whole lot of the other people. That's certainly true of, I refuse to call him, yay, Kanye West. You know, I had all of his recordings up to a certain point because I love them. You know, and he, he wasn't writing about, you know, killing anybody. But there is always the confrontational cadence. You get enough of that. So, where I get enough of that, I can tell a great many people think of it as the most wonderful thing in the world to listen to somebody bragging at length. I gets old for me, but, you know, that's just me. I can see you and Kanye in the ring right now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what's my name? What's my name? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> as uh, Muhammad Ali did, did back in the day. <laughs> That's what it would be. Yeah. <laughs> you, Glenn, though, you had you had a time. 
you were listening to 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 hip hop. I remember. Oh, yeah, the, I went back in uh, back in the day. It was a while ago, man. Uh, but I can remember in the late nineties, the early aughts. Uh, I'd had my Walkman, you know, <laughs> with, with my headphones, and I'd go out Always for my cool. morning exercise uh, hour or yeah. so, and I'd listen to to Kanye and and company. Uh, you know. Then what happened? Uh, I don't know. I kind of outgrew it maybe a little bit. Uh, d- didn't keep up. Uh, stopped walking an hour a day. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, you know, new media came online and other stuff, you know, so I could listen to podcasts while I'm walking instead of uh, <laughs> listening to hip hop, you know. But uh, I still appreciate it. Uh, my something. lovely wife, Lawan, is a big um, uh, pop music uh, fan. And keeps all these playlists and is always putting on uh, stuff. So, yeah, and you know, if you don't keep up to an extent, after a while, it starts to affect the validity of your contributions. I just try very hard not to utterly reject anything unless I really can't stand it, because there, there's a younger generation nipping at your heels, and if you have no idea, you start to you start to miss stuff. You want I want to at least try to be in their heads. And um, so, yeah. You know, John, John and I often talk about higher education on this podcast. Obviously, that's the universe we both inhabit. And why not? It's a topic that has moved front and center of late at both the state and national level. Free speech on campus, viewpoint diversity on campus, cancel culture on campus. Soaring tuition, affirmative action, race-based admissions, accreditation, the erosion of standards, attacks on the classics, hiring litmus tests, critical race theory, diversity, equity, and inclusion. You name it, it's in the news. So with all that's going on, and there's a lot going on, to whom can one turn as a trusted resource of all issues related to campus reform, whether you're a student, faculty, trustee, administrator, donor, policymaker, or alumni. One source we want you to know about and strongly recommend as a credible and respected voice on all these issues is the American Council of Trustees and Alumni, or ACTA, whom we're pleased to have supporting this episode. ACTA is on the front lines, promoting academic excellence, academic freedom and accountability at America's colleges and universities. They don't just serve as trusted advisors to college trustees and alumni, they help arm reformers with resources, ideas, recommendations, information, even grassroots alumni support through their Campus Freedom Initiative. They make positive changes happen and they approach these issues in a nonpartisan, balanced, informed, highly credible way, which we appreciate. If you care deeply about these issues, as John and I do, you really must know more about the American Council of Trustees and Alumni. Start by looking them up on the web at goacta.org. That's goacta.org. And follow them on Twitter and Facebook. John, what do you make of the uh, sensation that these uh, uh, these uh, guys, these white guys, rich men north of Richmond. Uh, I can't remember the guy's name. You know this, this has gone viral. This is a, a, a tune where he's complaining about, it's a popul- populist kind of uh, narrative oh. of how powerful people in Washington, D.C. are forcing stuff down our throats and we're not going to take it anymore. Uh, and then there was also Tried in a Small Town. You know this, that one. That's the one that I, yeah, I didn't know about this first one that you're talking uh, about. What's this rich thing? Rich men. See, I'm going to look ignorant. North of Richmond. Richmond. Yeah. Uh, but I, okay, so th- there exist white guys with guitars making up lyrics where they're saying stuff that MAGA people like. Mm-hmm. Uh, about whatever is going on. And uh, those tunes have gone viral. They become very popular. Rich men north of Richmond. Is this rapping? Uh, I was just or on singing? Joe Rogan. No, it's not rapping. Okay. It, it's, it's, it's country or 
in the same, you know, kind of that sort of thing. That sort of thing with okay. respect to the authors of these to- tunes, because we may not be doing them justice uh, musically speaking. But yeah, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Okay, but if you're not familiar with it, we can just move on to something else. Because I, I see it as a sign of a, a kind of, oh, oh, oh kind of uh, peak woke mm-hmm. shift in the culture. I, I think things are, are turning. Because this is, these things are appealing not just to MAGA people. These things are appealing to people who don't want to be told to take a vaccine that they don't want to take or who, who realize that uh, both parties are pretty much in agreement with some of the fundamental questions that uh, working people scratching the living out, uh, you know, and are wondering who's going to actually do something for me, you know, because they're scratching each other's backs. They're all corrupt. They're, you know, the cynicism, kind of distrust of institutions, this kind of. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I can actually, you know, we should touch on something. Peak woke. Are you sensing the way I am these days that something really has passed, that a pendulum is shifting in the general culture in terms of what people want to talk about, in terms of people being brave enough to keep doing what they're doing despite certain people yelling. I'm beginning to process 2020 and 2021 as a different time from 22 and 23, and not just because of the consecutiveness of the years. But you know, I wrote Woke Racism at a time, and I'm beginning to think I wouldn't write it now, that things aren't as extreme now as they were in the summer of 2020. Are you feeling that? Or are you feeling that those people are, are still winning? which is the way you felt about a year ago. I guess it depends on what you're talking about. I do feel that there's a shift. I think it depends on what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think at the editorial page at the New York Times or the Washington mm-hmm. Post or uh, CNN or whatnot, you know, those are still the same people and they're still in the sway of, of pretty much the same ideas. I. I think Chicago just elected uh, Brandon Johnson, uh, a very liberal Democrat who was a former uh, employee for the Chicago Teachers Union and, you know, is a guy to run that city. That's a city of three million plus people. And, you know, it, it's that's a pretty mainstream position, uh, you know. But, uh, yeah, I, I do sense uh, much more pushback. Uh, I was struck by, uh, you know, Trump was just arraigned in uh, Fulton County for the uh, face charges there for interfering with the Georgia election. Mm -hmm. Criminal charges. And he was mugshotted. Mm -hmm. So there's now, I mean, I don't know if you've seen it. Have you seen it? I I have. It's pretty striking. He must have posed for he that he must have practiced it. for days to get that one. thinking yeah you can tell cuz cuz it's clearly a a performance mm-hmm. on his part um but i was listening to one of these uh uh black uh podcasters sabrina salvati is her name she's out of boston she's a mm-hmm. lefty she, she's thoughtful she's creative she's interesting mm-hmm. and she did a did a thing where she uh put together a string of uh, videos illustrating black people empathizing with Trump mm-hmm. because of the harsh law that comes down on him. And, you know, what one guy was saying, man, if you've been to Fulton County jail, you, you, a nigga, you know, you're a nigga if you go through there. Cause that, cause you know, being, being on the short end of the law where you feel like you've been unfairly treated is something that black people can identify with, something like that. And there were a lot of black, and, and <laughs> there's one guy, uh, uh, the video, he has a sign, niggas for Trump. He's, you know, I mean, I'm just saying that's what he was, how he was marketed himself. And it was all that. No, I am not saying there's a groundswell of Trump support amongst black people, but I am saying some people are venturing outside the previously constraining lines of what it is that, that would be permissible to say. You know, I must say to you, and this is jumping boundaries, but I must say to you, Glenn, and I think I'm expressing a feeling many people have, I try so hard to put myself into other people's minds. You can't always succeed, but no one's crazy. No one's evil. That's my basic 
idea. You have to try to make sense in that person's mind. I am mystified that there can be a person with academic credentials and long experience as a public intellectual who actually believes that the 2020 election was stolen. You spoke to such a person, and I could not put myself. It's rare that I frankly watch another one of your interviews because I I frankly don't have time, but I was stunned by that. That that person actually believes those things. And I've been rattled by that for the past 48 hours just trying to put myself into her head. And I just wanted to say that because it's on my mind. And you probably can't say anything, but I don't get it. I don't understand. And it frustrates me when I can't even begin to understand. Well, then I've accomplished my purpose. We talk about Carol Swain, uh, formerly a professor at Vanderbilt in the law school, as well as in the political science department. And prior to that, a tenured professor at Princeton in politics, author of many books, uh, some of them quite good and and award-winning. Her first book, uh, Black Faces, Black Interest, made the argument that the interpretation of the Voting Rights Act that said that Black people were best served politically when they were represented by Black people was mistaken. It's a very Abigail Thernstrom friendly argument that she mm-hmm. made. And uh, a reasoned argument, too. Yeah, it, it, it's, a, it's, a very, it's a very good argument that she makes, and she has data, and she's a fr- frontline political scientist, and it got her tenure at Princeton. She's not a slouch by any means. She's a, she's a serious person. I've accomplished my goal, which was uh, not to uh, uh, further uh, conspiracy theoretic reasoning, but what's rather to illustrate the, uh, uh, how uh, widespread her views, which I believe to be erroneous, are. She's not the only one who thinks this. If she can think this, many other people can think it as well. They don't trust you know, the institution, they go to bed thinking that their guys went in, they wake up in the morning and the thing has flipped and they assume that some shenanigans had to go on. And she had her various theories about that. Uh, and I, I was in a way anticipating blowback and I got it uh, in the comments and whatnot. People took the view, many of them that you took. Some of them said, I see where she's coming from, even though I think she's wrong. Some of them said, I think she's right. But most of them said, what? You know, like that. I want to also say, I'm not saying you shouldn't have spoken to her. I'm just saying that I was... Okay, I appreciate that. Flabbergasted. Yeah. I appreciate that. And, you know, we were concerned about uh, getting in trouble with the social media platforms that are, you know, they don't want disinformation and misinformation being disseminated. Um, So uh, we're we're mindful of that. uh, But, and, and so far, so good, you know. Good. Good. But yeah. yeah. I just wanted to say that really that blew my mind. And maybe that's good for me, but it really blew my mind. Well, you know, Dinesh D'Souza, I know he's Dinesh D'Souza, made a whole film, what do you call it? Two thousand mules or something like that. Some number of mules. And the mules were the people <laughs> you had, you know, you had these deposit boxes for boxes, uh, right. the uh mail in ballots that could be picked up and then brought en masse to the uh voting uh registry. And uh, he claims that, uh, you know, they were being stuffed. These ballot boxes were being stuffed by people who were coming at the two o'clock in the morning and stuff. Like that. He claims to have photographs of them going in there and stuff like that. Um, Dinesh D'Souza, though, has a, a bee in his bonnet. And maybe that's putting it too politely. Dinesh D'Souza is, I'm going to say it. I'm sorry. He's an ideologue. He... Yeah has an agenda and facts can't get in the way. It's like Giuliani at this point. Giuliani has clearly had some sort of slight mental break or maybe he's an alcoholic or something. With D'Souza, I'm not sure what it is, but he started out as a sane person with sane ideas and at some point kind of turned a corner. Carol Swain is not that. That's why my mind was blown. It wasn't, okay, she's off the deep end. She's not, she's not capable of reasoning anymore. She is. I just, it was very interesting to see that version of reasoning coming from her. Weird to me. Yeah. Now, 
Suppose I were to say the following thing. Okay, the election was decided in 2020. Joe Biden won. He was certified. He's president of the United States. End of story. Two, uh, Trump should have stepped aside when he exhausted his options in court, even if he thought that uh, he was right and the courts were wrong and that he had been wronged in the election, because there was no other uh, legitimate way to proceed. And, you know, as I put it in conversation with you years ago, if they stole it from him, they stole it fair and square in the sense that if, if they stole it from him, it was just stolen. There wasn't anything to be done about it. And you better, you know, better luck next time. Um, but the but is, uh, what's wrong with having an election on election day? You know, the pandemic was an extraordinary circumstance that we want to build into the structure of our election processes, the expedients that were availed, uh, we availed ourselves of under those extraordinary circumstances, because there are real issues about the security of the process. Um, you know, if, if I have doubts about the integrity of the election, those are to be taken seriously, even if they're not. Uh, based on fact, because enough people with doubts is itself a really deep problem for the legitimacy of the system and therefore calls for things like uh, signature verification on mail-in ballots or a real ID uh, to be presented when you, when you uh, cast a ballot or stuff like that. Regardless of whether or not fraud is, this is an old conversation for me and you, regardless of whether or not fraud is demonstrable, are themselves desirable things to the extent that they help to build people's confidence in the results when they come out. And therefore, that's something that we should consider seriously and, and not attack people who want ballot security as being racist, this kind of idea. So, you know, that, I think that's some common ground that I would share with Carol Swain, a concern about the uh, appropriateness for uh, election security and, you know, that kind of thing. I can go. I can go for that. Um, a lot of people are going to say, no matter how much security you had, no matter how many precautions you took, no matter how many you know double and triple layers of security there were, a certain kind of person would still be complaining because this is all about not wanting black people to vote. Um, I'm going to go agnostic on that particular question here. That's um, progress. <laughs> because, <laughs> but only because we're coming to the end and it wasn't the official topic. But no, I, I, I get what you mean. I, I get what you mean completely. I remember one time I was on some show. I think I was on Chris Hayes back when I was um, in MSNBC's Good Favor and I was on it and they had me and some other people and, and Al Sharpton was, was remote and he was complaining about the whole issue of why do you have to get an ID, et cetera. And I just said, Reverend Sharpton, how come, um, you know, we can protest in all of this because I understand that there's some shady goings on here and that there's a pragmatic effort out to stop black people from voting because of our being all Democrats, not because of the color of our skin. But I said, why don't you also just make sure people get the damn cards? You know, what's so terrible about that? Yeah. And he didn't, he didn't disagree. But yeah, I, I get your point. Yeah, that, that, that alone is fine. But to use... Giuliani talking points as defense of the idea that the election was stolen and not to engage with the rather conclusive refutations of those claims in widely available sources struck me as some I could fit it into my sense of order is I just it was interesting to say the least well Carol's latest, uh, one of her latest uh, contributions is a course at Prager University. She's doing that? Tracing the history of the race positions of the Democratic and the Republican Party, or perhaps I should say the Democrat and the Republican Party. And pointing out that the Democrats, you know, were on the wrong side of the race question for a long time, from pre-bellum days onward, mm -hmm. uh, and that the Republicans were the party of Lincoln and were on the right side of that question. Uh, and yet, when we get to the present day, it's the Republicans who are presumptively assumed to be racist and the Democrats who are presumptively assumed to be in the corner of Black people. That's her argument at PragerU. 
So she she dug in. I mean, she you know she's a a, a warrior. She's she's a well, culture warrior on the right. Yeah. You know, she's a Christian woman, very self consciously so. She's pro life, et cetera, um, and anti DEI, et cetera. Glad, can you inform me? I've heard that argument before, and this is not me dogpiling on Carol Swain. This is just general. Why is it important that Republicans and Democrats were uh, different parties way, way back in the day? So, yeah, it's not. It, Democrats, it's, in, in my view, it's not. It's a kind of essentialism. They had the same name. Right. Therefore, I'm, you know, I'm responsible as a Democrat in 2023. I'm not. But if I were for what the Democrats who were on the bench when the Dred Scott decision was handed down in 1856. <laughs> or Same party label, therefore you, you are responsible for their misdeeds. Or the Dixiecrat senators, you know, even as late as the 60s who were resisting civil rights legislation, you have to think about that they were there. But that was 400 years ago itself. And so the issue is, what is it now? What has it been since, you know, 1970? I've just never, people have written whole books before about that. Look at what those Democrats did in 1518. I don't, I don't understand why that's important myself. Yeah. Uh, I was going to ask you about one thing, though, about the election. So here's another argument. It's not, it wasn't stolen. It was rigged. This was offered in some of the comments to Carol Swain. It wasn't stolen. There's no evidence that it was stolen, but it was rigged, by which they mean uh, the Hunter Biden laptop story was suppressed. Uh, the security experts who said it had all the hallmarks of Russian disinformation were organized by Anthony Blinken, currently Secretary of State, uh, at the time a, a principal in West Exec. I think that's the name of the uh, consulting firm that he and several other high, highly placed uh, you know, uh, uh, insiders uh, formed and whatnot. But in any case, uh, the social media uh, collaboration and suppression of that story and so forth, uh, it was rigged. It wasn't, it wasn't a fair fight because there was a bias in reporting. Certainly there was, was bias about various things. It's a rather athletic use of the word rigged, though. A little dramatic. I mean, I, I see what they mean, but that's not what I think of as rigging an election. Forget the stealing, but... That's not rigged. That's that the election took place amidst the realities of partisan politics and the nature of American media in this particular time slice. Uh, I get their point, but I wouldn't use that word. It worries me going forward because of all these indictments of Trump. I mean, he may win, which is a problem in, of itself. He may lose, which could be a problem in itself, uh, especially when you have local prosecutors bringing uh relatively weak cases against him. It looks highly politically motivated and whatnot. And then people can say, you know, if it's a razor thin outcome and happens under those conditions, uh, somebody put their thumb on the scale. Uh, lawfare is what they call it now, using the law to wage warfare against your political opponents. Mm -hmm. uh, I just, I worry. I mean, I, we can blame Trump because he did not accept the 2020 outcome and he has let Project. loose this thing. He's let this thing loose in the in the land. Uh, I don't know if we get the genie back in the bottle uh, from this. And you know, when Al Gore decided to step aside in two thousand, you know, with a stronger case than Trump might have been able ever to mount about how that election was inappropriately decided, they stopped count recounting the ballots in Florida. Um, he, he set one kind of precedent. Trump, when he fought on like he has done, has set another. And the reaction to Trump is setting precedents of its own. And I, I don't know, I don't know where this leads for us. It doesn't, it gives me the creeps. You know what? I'm, I'm going to try something, Glenn, that's going to look really goofy in two years, but I want to try this because there's a part of me that can feel it. I can be good at things like this. Like I used to always say that um, long before his, his passing, so I say, Michael Jackson's never going to be old. And I didn't know anything about the drugs, but I just said he is never going to be an old man. I would be surprised if he made it to 50. And I was right. He, he, he died. I could always tell. On this one, and I do not believe in the occult in any way, but on this one, Trump's going to get sick. It's going to be the chanciness of social history. Like, God forbid that man become president again. And yeah, if he doesn't become president, we still have hell to pay. 
I'll bet he gets sick. This is so horrific. And it's not that it's not about God, but he's not a young, young man at all. And he's, he's, he's not, he doesn't take care of himself at all. I'll bet he's not going to survive. Just saying. Wow. You go I, out I, on the limb on that, I man. Keep thinking about this or he's going to be so weakened that all of this is just going to be mum. Just mark my words. This is goofy to the extreme. Because yeah. I agree with you. If he gets in, it's going to be horrific. If he's out, we still have this possible civil war. You seem to be more afraid of that than me, but I know I some, something could happen. And even if it wasn't a civil war, it's not going to be pretty. But the other alternative is that finally that man is going to show his age and not be able to perform in any real way. That's the third thing that could happen. And he's just asking for it. Just saying. He looks healthier than Joseph Biden to me, but I, true. I mean, I'm looking at TV, so how do I true, know? True, but that's partly the, the fake tan. And if you watch him kind of negotiating staircases, he doesn't do it all that much better than, than Biden does. And I just think to myself, hmm, what might happen to this man? So we'll see. This is space age, folks, I know. But it's something I think about all the time, that one outcome here could be that he, he loses his health. So. Yeah, there's yet another outcome that I shudder to even think about. The Huey I, Long outcome. Um, if that could happen, it would have happened already. I, I'm surprised. Um, but then again, no one got Obama either, and there were threats all the time. I think the security is good enough to guarantee that that's not going to happen. Um, I sure hope so, because that would be a disaster for us. Why? Well, because it would lead to civil war. Quote you mean unquote. that would? You mean if somebody? Yeah. yeah if somebody, oh, I see what you mean because, right, the idea that, oh, they actually killed him. Right. Yeah. yeah. I was trying to avoid saying it, but yeah. All thinking. <laughs> we are going to catch such hell for just the last three minutes of this, but it was just something that has been on my mind. It's something I think about. And I have just been talking. We, we're just right. two guys here talking. I mean, we, and I we should didn't... say that what I'm saying is not some veiled way of saying I hope somebody. Should, yeah, I, that, I, that shouldn't I, I happen just... to anybody. I'm thinking of just his own health, and so. Okay, well, I think that's a wrap for our uh, biweekly this time. And uh, <laughs> Carol Swain, if you're out there, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Take the measure of the criticism because you, John McWhorter is not alone. Uh, I'm sure you know that. Uh, anyway, we're the Glenn Show. We look at all sides. We talk to all people. Uh, I've, I've had Charles Murray on the Glenn Show. I've had Cornell West on you the Glenn Show. I've had Norman Finkelstein on the Glenn <laughs> um, So Anyway, John, thanks a lot. Thanks, Glenn. See you in a couple of weeks. Yeah.